We're very lucky. We've got a good friend of mine, John, who's going to talk to us on Rome. Uh, I'm not going to buy him on Rome, but uh, he'll talk about it. Uh, John spent a decade on Rome in the 70s, mid 80s, yeah. um, overseeing the reintroduction of the white cell people. He also found time to research the history of the island. Uh, he wrote a book on the island and several other publications in shorter form. Uh, and also to um, do a lot of field archaeology and uh, looking at the machines, particularly, which are absolutely fascinating. Um, so I'll hand you over to John. He will take you through the next part of the evening. And uh, hopefully it will all go well. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming. Um, I first went to Rome in 1969. I have to be careful when I say I had a decade on Rome because people think it's both single malt. That's my my trip. So um, I first went in 1969 on a field trip as a student from Aberdeen University, and. We in April before the Midges came out, and then in 1975, as Simon said, I went there um, for six weeks to the rucksack, and nearly 10 years later, I left with a wife, a dog, a house full of furniture, and God knows what we had to hide a boat to get home. And um, so I know the place pretty well. It's not my favorite island, and it's not just the weather. It's I always think rum looks better from everywhere else. Uh, but I have to move in on my way to reach this. Can you still see me? Uh, yeah, I called the talk and the book A Landscape Without Figures, which is actually a quote from Hugh Miller, who was a bit of a hero of mine when I was at school, because the Inverness Library didn't stretch to many natural history books. And so I had to resort to Hugh Miller's volumes, which are can be heavy going, but full of interest. Um, heavy going geologically, but he says, I'll read it out, but the whole of the once peopled interior remains a wilderness without inhabitant, all seem to bespeak a place of fitting habitation for man in which not only the necessaries, but also a few of the luxuries of life might be procured, but in the entire prospect, not a man, not a man's dwelling, no mention of women, could the eye command, the landscape was one without figures. And I still think Rome's a bit like that today. We'll get on. I should have had called this talk the early history or something. Call it archaeology was a bit of a cheat. And thank goodness Anne spotted that and mentioned a subtitle to the talk about the shillings and the clearances, which is where I'll end. Um, so in case you don't know where Rum is, it's one of the four small isles, it's the biggest of the small isles, and it was the a volcano at one time, just like the Kulamid Sky in Kilda, um, Argenbergen, Antrim, and such like. So, but the lava that makes up most of Kana, Kana, their egg, muck, that's Hedgeker Lighthouse. If you go off the Lost Boys to Perry, you'll get good views of rum as you go past on the way into Mali. It's quite a big island. It's about 64 square miles and it's roughly about 
seven or eight miles north to south and not quite as much east to west. Nearly all the people live around Kidlock here. There's a research facility of cottage there. Um, and we'll come to the rest of the um, And it's a pretty unforgiving sort of landscape, really. This is the north end. You can see Kinloch, Loch Creesor, up in the northeast corner, and Kilmory, um, the north end. Most of what you see there is Corridonian sandstone. And the lava, not it's not lava, Gabbro from uh, the volcano is the bottom uh, of the picture. That, the, these are the main hills, the two with the snow on them. The right-hand one is Askeval, which is the tallest, I think it's 2,600, and Halval. And then there are various other ones, the Corries in between. And bottom left is Harris, which uh, has a raised beach and uh, had quite a population there at one time. It's 15 miles out from Arisig. I love the Malik Road, particularly the old road, um, because going around by motor and that is and Arisig is magical. And this is looking to Egg on the left and Rum. You can see Askeval the highest, Halaval to its right, and then a complex of Scroon and Gideon, um, Trolladal. You can't see Trolladal, you see it in a minute. And as I say, it looks majestic, mostly from everywhere else. And from the opposite side, looking back to um, from Cana, uh, it's a super view. And at sunset, I like to think of it as Red Rum. I was there when Red Rum won the national, and most of the folk on rum had a bet on it. <laughs> And that's Sandy, uh, Canada is actually two islands, tidal sandy beyond, with a little bit of matter in the beach. And uh, well, it used to be a footbridge, which has disappeared about five times in the 1900s. Um, and Sandy and the big church, you can see out to the left there. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk about Bloodstone Hill here and various other things, Gurdle. Um, there's a lighthouse, a small automatic lighthouse, sun mount. And I think one of the finest views is from Canna, and it was painted watercolors. I love this man's. Watercolors, Roland Svensson. He was a Swede who visited Tristan de Kuna, um, Bear Isle, Kula, all sorts of remote islands all over the world. And I never met him, um, but I know his son very well, Torbjorn, who's a ship's captain. And um, this watercolor hung in Canna House. He gave it to the Campbells of Canna. Back in the day of when this is 1975, probably when Mali was the premier fishing port, really, on the west coast. And the varnished boat on the left is the Western Isles, which is still on the go. You wouldn't recognize it now. I think it was beautiful when it was varnished. Not sure what the ship is. Do you recognize it? Oh, Michael. Most likely old Claymore. Old Claymore, okay. And chuck a block with fishing boats and walkers, fish boxes. They're still turning up. Um, the, it went through various, after the clearances, one of the owners was Lord Salisbury, the father of the Victorian Prime Minister. And he tried to alter the um, river system to improve it for fishing. 
and built that dam, which actually swept away, it got washed away the first time, uh, virtually in a few days after they filled. Where the helicopter is, this big lock. This is the school's Hebridean Society that used to go there camping. And, but they wouldn't do it in the winter time. That was um, four inches of rain and 36 hours fell that day, and the whole of Kingbury Glen was flooded. Um, and one of the boys had broken a leg or something and got helicoptered off. But <laughs> they, they say if, if it's not the rain, it's the midges. And the clegs are bad and the ticks are bad. So, <clears throat> and again, the wise Hugh Miller says, uninhabited originally saved by wild animals, it became at an early age the home of men. And this is a archaeological visitor park in Denmark, which I thought was probably what there first settlers and rum would be. They're from Mesolithic times. And I don't know if some of you knew Caroline Wickham Jones, who came and excavated uh, the farm fields in 84 to 86, and found tremendous amount. Her report is over there uh, on the table, if you want to have a look. These are Mesolithic microliths which were very, very abundant. And as Simon and I were discussing, there's not a lot of flint in the Western Isles. And the bloodstone on rum is um, a good substitute. She also excavated a Neolithic uh, presence. And these are bits of pottery. And it had black gunge on the inside of the shirts of pottery. And when they excavated, when they looked at it under the microscope, it had um, pollen of meadow sweets and royal fern and grain and various things. And they concluded that it was actually held an alcoholic drink, not rum, I'm afraid. But I think it very appropriate that Scotland's first brew should come from an island called Rum. <laughs> <clears throat> and several arrowheads, none of which were excavated. The one on the right is good bloodstone, dark green with blood red spots through it. And that was excavated in 1882 from egg. And the bloodstone came to be traded throughout the West Coast. The one on the right was found um, at Salmon and Incha at the northeast corner of Rome, around from Kilmori, where the Queen and Britannia used to have picnics. Periodically, but the school's Hebridean Society were camped there once and found, I think, two other heads. I'm not sure what the other one. But I went to see it in the what it was then the Royal Scottish Museum and noticed in one of their cases the one from Egg. And I pointed that out to them and said, You realize that's bloodstone? And they've since, I think, got an exhibit based around bloodstone and how it was treated around the place. But while I was there, uh, a geologist up on Halival found this blood, this arrowhead. Uh, it's a bleached bloodstone. Uh, it's just one arrowhead, but different signs of it. And so whether in Neolithic times they were up there hunting, probably, Carmigan, which aren't there now, or deer even, but whatever, uh, must have dropped it. And then two years later, one year later, one of the estate workers, Richard McIver, uh, was in his tractor plowing the field uh, near where the excavation took place and spotted this line on the ground, the one at the top right, left. And 
how he spotted it from his tractor, I'll never know. Um, but so these are three good examples from Rum of a Neolithic presence. And that's Gladstone Hill. There's a seam of it up near the summit, but you could pick up lots of it along the shore underneath because it was quite a sort of eroded um, face. And in Victorian times, they opened up a little quarry there and excavated. And there was a slab of bloodstone made into a coffee table for Queen Victoria, apparently, from up there. But they probably took it back to Kinloch um, to work it into tools and the like. And I don't know what any of you make of this. Um, I thought there might have been old burial mounds that have been robbed of their stone. These are two examples at Harris, overlooking Harris. And Ian Thornborough, a friend in Morburn, thought they were curved cairns, but I'm not quite sure what a curved cairn is. But anyway. I'd be interested if anybody wants to offer anything. Um, in the foreground there, there's a promontory, and you can see a bit of the walling there at Bloodstone Hill behind. And so there was an Iron Age um, promontory fort there. And Ian had a friend with a helicopter and flew around Ramla on a couple of occasions. And took lots of aerial photos for me, and this is one he sent me. You can see some of the stonework on the promontory fort there. And then we come into early Christian times. That was the archaeology, by the way. This is now into early Christian times. And there is mention, well, there is known uh, Saint Beckham, who was a monk from Iona. And there were several Beckons, but hopefully it's this one. And he wrote a poem, he was a poet as well. He wrote a poem about Columba, saying how he crossed the long haired sea, foam flecked, seal filled, uh, white tipped. That's not very clear. Um, but it is, he is mentioned in the annals of Ulster as the Irish Annals, as Beckon of Rum died in Britain on the 17th of March. I think it's 676 AD, um, although in one of the Annals it says 677, but there was a comet which seems to throw it back a year to what they said. <laughs> and when T.S. Muir, an antiquarian, went to Rum in 1884, he went straight to Kumori, which is the obvious place for religious remains or whatever. And he turned over the stone. He didn't notice the pattern. He turned it over and there was a Latin cross on the underside. And I think he left it like that because the next people who came to take an interest were the Royal Commission and ancient monuments who didn't um, see the Latin cross, but when they turned the stone over, it had a pattern on it, a marigold cross. And then when I came along <coughs> in the 70s, early, mid 70s, I couldn't see this marigold cross that they described but underneath was the Latin cross that T.S. Muir had described. So a year later, I turned it over to kill off the lichen. And um, it revealed this lovely marigold cross on a pedestal with a, a small Latin cross surmounting it. Uh, um, and so that's what's there now lying in the burial ground. It probably should be upright. That's the Latin cross on the underside that T.S. Muir first spotted. And I took a rubbing of it and sent it to Ian Fisher in the pink. 
chair of the Royal Commission, who was an expert on um, Celtic artwork and Celtic crosses. And mm -hmm. he came out, he was doing a book on the Celtic crosses of the small isle. And Ian Scott, who was the artist with the commission, that was my rubbing. Um, oh no, that's a different cross. Right, so we're now at just south of Kinloch on the east side, there's a bay called Barton and Luna, which is the Bay of the Key. And there was mention in the 30s of a Celtic cross there. And the man says it was small and easily portable and it's nowhere to be found now. And I couldn't believe that it had been removed. So I kept going out there uh, at low tide to try and find it. And eventually I did find it. And it was com almost completely submerged. It was about that much of it showing. So the whole thing's about five feet long. <laughs> and I sort of felt underneath the sand, they cleared it away and I could feel the cross. So we dug it out, the friend and I, and turned it over. And lo and behold, that's what it was. So I took out a rubbing of that to send to Ian uh, Bishop as well. And but we couldn't move it. It was quite big and heavy. So I put it on a raft of driftwood, thinking it would stay on the surface. But in fact, it was completely gone when I went back a couple of months later in the summer. And dug it, I knew where it was, so I dug it out and went back with three friends and we rolled it up the beach. And I set it upright. Ian, by the way, said it was seventh, possibly eighth century, both these crosses. And I went back with a spade a couple of days and weeks later and dug a hole and stuck it in the ground so we wouldn't lose it again. And I was intrigued. There's a group of people who take a great interest in Dunlop Castle. Can't imagine why. But um, they have a newsletter, and there was this article in the newsletter which mentions the Celtic cross at Bagdadur and said, it's amazing. It's perfectly aligned to the midwinter sunset. And <laughs> <laughs> I just dug a hole and stuck it in. <laughs> there are various caves around which did show signs of uh, human habitation at one time, but they've never been excavated. That's Caroline Wickham Jones on the left there. We did the excavation after going over there to ensure there was bloodstone over there. Uh, where the Gekin, the monk, probably lived as a hermit was a place called Papadil, which was north for Dale of the Priest. But I'm not sure that the north were there when the monks initially went there, but I don't know, certainly not before Beckham was there. And there's nowhere I could find that might have been Beckham's cell other than that mound up there. But it's a lovely spot, it's a, quite a hike to get into it. And I was taken around by our boat the Nature Conservancy Council spoke at the time and put ashore there. So I was going to walk back. And when I sort of the boat went off around the corner to do some work, and I climbed up the shore and discovered I was on a little rock island. There's no way I could access the main island. But I knew the boat was coming back. So I managed to hail them. Down and they put me ashore somewhere sensible. Otherwise, I'd be there to this day, I think. <laughs> There's a photo that Ian Thornberg took looking down, and it's a lovely spot. It's a sun trap, a good brown trout in the loch. There were probably that plantation was planted with gorse and other things in the 60s. So, um, an ideal spot for a, 
among similar in isolation. And you can actually see Iona away in the distance. That's actually the map you can see it as well. And A is actually a gold eagle nest on the uh, scree slope to the left of that photo, which is now a seed, which I was. And um, that's what it looks like. There was a stack offshore. But if you go around by the sea and look in, you would never know it was there. So it was probably a good, safe place for um, a monk or even a community to live without being threatened by Vikings or whoever, Pictish pirates. Viking presence. Not a lot. Um, all the main peaks have got Viking names and even the, most of the major glens. So they were probably using them more as sea marks and navigation aids. Askeval, Trollaval, Halaval, and then Dibidil and Duridil, for instance. But in, I'm not sure when this was found. But it's in the museum in Edinburgh as well. A lovely Norse gaming piece with the interlaced pattern on one side of Narkel, I believe. And somebody was doing a, an honours thesis there in 1949, Drew Smith, and he found what he said was a Viking burial kist which he unearthed, but we've no idea where it is now. So the Vikings didn't have a big presence on drum, and I can imagine why. Because if it's not the rain, it's the midges, and there's not a lot of fertile ground, there's not a good anchorage other than one can lock. This was a, a birthday party we had for the um, host whispers, 40th birthday. And we all went, somehow managed to get costumes together. And Stuart and Janet, I think, won the prize. And for a long time after that, Rum was part of the medieval Lordship of the Isles, owned by Clan Ranald, who lost it uh, nefariously to the Maclean's of Call. And uh, they had it right up to the clearances. That's the Berlin that's actually in at Kildonan now when it was uh, roaming the west coast. Look at the old maps. Blau's map from the 16th century is a bit skew with, and you can see Kinloch is in the wrong orientation, as are the other islands. I got an uncolored copy of this from Margaret Page Shaw. Thank you. What did they live on? Um, they would have the people slowly built up. Yeah, I'll show you the population figures. Slowly built up numbers. They would have had black cattle, which they might not have been able to swim ashore like they did on Sky to take them to market in the central belt. But the Nature Conservancy brought in that herd of island cows, and we had some black ones. <clears throat> and there were Hebridean sheep, probably, um, would have been the common one. Ram had a stud of ponies, which are probably Viking ponies, I think, but they're quite a sturdy, strong breed that's been outbred with various other things since, but it's now recognized as a study of its own, about 20 or 30 of them run ponies. And I didn't realize until Reverend Walker's account of 1764, um, that there were goats kept, and they actually, he says they sent the mohair off and got some money for it. So that's from the slopes of Halabal looking down at the lock. The farm fields, you can see where the two houses are, is where they excavated. Looking across to Soy, 
with the cooling of sky behind the Loch Scavy. Um, used to go up there because of the Mount Shearwaters. More about that in a minute. That's Kilmory, and there's a burial ground there behind that ruin. And there was quite a, a strong human occupation there. You can see the lazy beds by the river mouth. But no obvious chapel, although Martin Martin, I think there's mentions the chapel there. That's one of Ian's aerial photographs. Um, and I noticed that the wall at the river's corner has collapsed since I was there and took that last photo. You can see the stone slab lying, two of them lie side by side there. And there are various other um, sort of cross slabs and things, which I'll show you in a second. This is Harris Bay with the raised beach on the right. And there was a shooting lodge built there in the 1880s or thereabouts, um, and various tree plantations, and facing southwest. And that's where the biggest human population was. And I got interested in the shillings because people were misinterpreting them. And the other accounts of the history of the island were way off the mark. So I started researching it quite thoroughly and covered every inch of the island, mapping out where the ruins were, particularly the shillings. And you can see little dots there. I found in the end 377, and I think a few others have been added to by the Royal Commission when they reserved it, surveyed it using my maps. And the stars represent where the nine uh, villages were with Harris down in the southwest, in Loch, and even at Papadil, there were a few. Lastly, there were shepherds outposted there. I could have saved myself bother because Paul's map of 1801 shows you where the nine settlements were and names them. So um, <clears throat> and I did a sketch of the Harris one with the walls, and it's not a very good slide back, but it, the cluster of houses. And this is Runrig as it initially as it originally was, a cluster of houses with all the outfields, uh, with lazy beds and such like, and then beyond the high dike out on the island, the rest of the island are the shields. And it's an amazing complex of St. Kilda's like this. I mean, the original village wasn't that street that everybody used in Asa, but it was a cluster of houses set up in a slightly more sheltered part of Village Bay with an outfield and um, such like. There was a catechist in Neil McNeil in 1764 gave the Reverend Walker a list of people on Rama at that time. Uh, depending on which version you look at, it's around 300 plus or minus 10 or so. And you can see Harris and Kilmori for the largest. But even 12 people at um, Papadol, that could only be one family, you know, two families. You know. And that's the human a uh, record of human presence on Rum. 1400, John of Fordham mentions few inhabitants. Geographical collection says that Rum will raise six or seven men, but what that quite means, don't know. By 1728, there was 152 people over five years old. 
Um, Reverend Webster in 1755 said 206 inhabitants. Reverend Walker, 10 years later, said 297 or 304. Thomas Pennant mentioned 325. It peaked at uh, 1794, but the old statistical account gave 443. And, um, but in 1826, it was cleared uh, completely bar one family, but in two separate uh, evictions. And it was an eviction. The people didn't really want to leave, but the landlord or his factor gave them no option. 134 were left after the first one, but they very quickly followed on to Cape Breton, and some of them went on to New Zealand and Canada and places, uh, America after that. So that by 1828, there was only one family left. And he was allowed to remain behind because he was related to the Maclean's of Call, and he lived on into the 1880s. Um, and was quite a tradition bearer at that time, the only one, because all the traditions disappeared virtually the place names. It hadn't been for um, him, uh, the place names would have gone as well. That's what the village at Harris looked like. There's a modern shepherd's cottage built in the uh, early 1900s and various things. So, quite a complex and a lovely example because most places in uh, the Highlands suddenly went on to a crofting presence, which altered the landscape completely. Whereas Rum didn't have that, it went straight from being an unsuccessful sheep farm to a shooting estate. So it didn't go through a crofting phase. So all that is preserved and beautifully. And that affected the shillings as well. Suddenly the shillings weren't used after that, other than a few modifications. But that's at Harris, uh, the lazy beds on Gwalanda Park. And from up top, looking back down onto the race beach and the village off to the right. Um, and it was from up there, I suppose, I first encountered my shielding, first shielding. And it was a loch that came to be known as Loch Monica because that was Lady Monica who owned it in Italy. Um, but it probably had a good Gallic name at one time. And this is one of the few that has a cell still covered over in the old traditional um, uh, beehive shaped, corbelled uh, construction. And I went around and eventually started mapping them all. And I didn't have a tape measure, so I pasted it out. So it's all very crude, uh, but try to write descriptions of what this is just one example of Tuckadaw um, and some of the shillings um, that I sketched. And this is out to Papadol's on that point uh, beyond. And but there was a line of shillings there which were really weird. And John Fletcher, who actually was a vet that brought the deer back to St. Hewitt's in 1973, he reckoned this was a deer trap. And I never believed him. I can't imagine they would scare deer off a 300 foot cliff, pick up the pieces of venison at the bottom, and then have to hike it all the way back up to the <laughs> So that was my rough map of it. Um, and I think it was just a wall with, um, they probably posted the boys and girls to herd the stock, the sheep and the cattle, and prevent them going over the cliff.
But then gradually, as I found more and more feelings, I went to the ones that I knew of, and you got your eye in, you realize that this could make a good shilling site, and you'd go to it, and sure enough, there would be shillings there. And I sort of classified them in according to the construction. And I called this a chamber, which was probably roofed over with bits of driftwood timber and turf, um, with a cell attached to it at one end, a stone cell. And this is the one that is quite big above Kinloch, which is about the only one, possibly two, that are still roofed over, and you can climb into it quite easily. Um, quite a good construction. That was my colleague called Ron. And that's from inside, excuse me, inside looking out towards A in the distance. But it's about the only one that was still roofed over, which makes me think most of them were built of, uh, built up with turf uh, rather than stone. But you'd often find that they'd build a shilling where there was an easy supply of stone. And the timbers were probably quite valuable on rum because there were no trees. So they would uh, preserve them for the next year and then do up with turf ready for use the next season. And gradually it developed a mound of presumably old turf and they've excavated some sky, which shows that there were previous dwellings there at one time. But that's a good chamber in a cell example. Some of them were rectangular. I'm slightly wary about this one because I think it was mentioned that they brought in a Welsh quarrier, quarryman to build the wall. You can see away at the on this cliff top in the distance. And I think he might have done this up as somewhere to stay while he was building the wall. But there were rectangular shielings uh, scattered all over the place. And this is it according to altitude. I put in for Harris, the 200 meter contour and a lot of the shillings are uh, clustered around that. In Kinloch, um, above the village, it's the 100 meter contour, as it is on the other side of Kilmore Glen. Uh, Papadil, they were much higher, um, or they couldn't get much higher. It had to be 100 meter uh, because it was so steep and rocky. And then Gurudo was the one where they were much higher up to 300 because that's where there was a good expanse of vegetation and grazing. So you can see three peaks there of where the shillings and drum were situated according to altitude. They also liked shelter. And most of the doorways that were visible faced east, some west, but a few to the north, but on the sheltered side, really. Um, Gurudal, top right, is a bit odd. I'm not quite sure why uh, they were scattered in all directions out there. Just be more that green light at the bottom, there is a group of shillings. And the size, most of them were up to three or four shillings, but some of them, one went up to 22. What I identified as a shilling might not be strictly uh, correct. Uh, it was hard to make them out sometimes. And that's a good example of a mounded shilling where the chamber uh, had built this accumulation of debris from previous years. And also the fact that in the summer they would bring the stock near the shilling. Again, it was the uh, young folk who heard it from mostly in the summer. Um, and the grazing and uh, guano that done 
on the stove to get that assisted uh, the vegetation growth. And when you looked at the three types, um, the cells didn't have a lot of mounding around them at all. And I reckon they were older. The chambers and chambered cells had a fair degree of a quarter of them or more were mounted, but the rectangles, nearly half of them were mounted, and I reckon they were the youngest. So, as I say, probably we're talking about who knows how old uh, when they were first built, but by 1826, most of them weren't being used because the people had left. This is a mounted a mounted shilling up on the slopes of Barkeval. Um, and that was another interesting feature of the shillings that um, there's a cave behind there. And these were probably quite defensive. Um, there are lots of examples of the school of egg, for instance, has uh, got a, a fort on top of it, as does Dune of St. Gilda. So there was a defensive element because of wartime. And clan warfare was quite right at that time. You often found them near water as well because they needed a supply of uh, fresh water to wash out the um, containers and the uh, um, jars and things, making cheese and butter. I um, often walk back to the village regularly to deliver that back. The other interesting thing that you were able to do on rum was there was a very good six inch map in the four sheets that uh, I think Glasgow University produced. And that was used as a basis then in 1970 for Chris Ferreira, a very good botanist, to map the vegetation and classify the plant communities. And the, um, I can't remember, but I can't quite read what the key is there. But when you superimposed the shielding distribution on top of that map, uh, this is what you got looking at the nine or ten. Um, the Herbridge Heath was by far the best grazing. And lo and behold, that's where you got most of the shillings. I guess the, the Stuka mixture was quite good too, as was even Heather Moore. And all the rest of the stuff was rubbish. So they didn't bother building on them at all. So it was rather nice to relate the density of shillings to the type of vegetation. Um, and they were quite sensible in where they built them. Oops, go back. Yeah. Thomas Pennant visited the Inverness in 1772, a great zoologist, naturalist. And he had uh, with him an artist, Moses Cooper, who, when they visited uh, Jura, these are packs of Jura, and they just uh, believe it or not. Um, Moses Griffith, for some reason, built these teepees of uh, shillings, and only one of them is a sort of beehive shape, which I think would have been a common one. Um, and you can see driftwood there being used to build up the church. Uh, but this is a rather fanciful, even the paps of Jura don't look like that. <laughs> and then you get odd clusters, and uh, this is what locally on the island we always refer to as fishermen's potties. But there's no reason why they weren't so rich in their chillings. And then an odd structure, this is on the top of Gladstone Hill. God knows what that was used for, probably as a habitation. Overlooks the grazing quite nicely. But then I found this and then another one that was completely different than it. Obviously, was not a shilling. 
And this is where I thought the deer trap was. I mean, you'll see it in the next few slides, but from the top right, you'll see a grassy slope that's almost been cleared of stone that they would drive the deer and often the clansmen would gather and drive the deer downhill into this big enclosure, which is sort of funneled in and the big dike around it where the men with spears and swords and whatever would slaughter as many of the deer as possible. That's where the wall has been cleared back to allow the deer free movement encourage them to run down the hill. And Dean Monroe in 1549 calls them principal seats. Um, and the tangle was the actual um, gather of the deer and drives them down. That's a sketch I made at the time of the deer trap. But the best example comes from not surprisingly, Hugh Miller, but also Edward Daniel Clark, a geologist, 1797. Here at the bottom of this crater of Audubon, Mr. McLean showed me the remains of snare used for taking the red deer at a time when they were exceedingly numerous upon the island. About 10 years ago, they became perfectly extinct on rock. Not surprisingly, the mode in which these snares were constructed to sit the wall or of stones erected alongside the mountain, Lacking a considerable part of it near its vein, uh, either extremity of which a pit was formed. And in this pit, the hunter was stationed himself with his gun. A number of people were then employed to alarm the deer and instantly taking to the mountain, meeting the wall, run along the side of it until we came to the pit. And um, that's from the top of the hill looking down of uh, and an aerial photograph of it in the opposite direction but by Ian Thormer in his helicopter. There was actually another one I found on the other side of the skyline there where they would run them down in a different direction. But it was a considerably um, a complex structure and a lot of work. And this is Glendoyan Black Valley, we called it. And the arrow shows where the deer trap I've shown you is. The other one's on the other side of that ridge. It's not so well preserved. So, what were they eating as well as deer? Uh, and as I say, Edward Daniel Clark said it became extinct about 1790. And interestingly, um, Martin Martin describes that the natives say it proves fatal to the posterity of the Maclean's of Call family that if any of them shoot at a deer on the mountain of Pionka, <laughs> dies suddenly or contracts some violent distemper. And Pionka is that conical hill on Rum in the distance. And you can see a sort of half hollow and even today or well when i was there the stalkers referred to that as maternity hollow and a lot of hinds would go there to have their calves and the stalkers would never shoot them there and i wondered if there was a little bit of an element of um tradition behind that superstition also the hills on realm are rather unique in that from about 2,000 feet up, uh, you've got Max Shearwater's breathing. And I love this quote by Ossian, and the person's Ossian, the spirit of the mountain shriek. And if you go up there at night when the Shearwaters come in, it's an amazing experience. I've spent several nights up there and had Shearwaters excavating into my sleeping bag and kicking dirt over me all night and all sorts of things. But the noise is incredible. They only come in at night, they're all day out at sea, except if they're incubating their eggs, come in to feed the single chick in the burrow, which I took out for the sake of the photograph. And the locals used to eat them. 
not just on Rome, um, called Fakrax, they called them. And one of the hills on Rum, particularly dense in numbers of shearwaters there, and it's called the Hill of the Trolls. You can only assume the Vikings were up there and heard the shrieking from the sky and in the ground beneath their feet. And not knowing what my shearwaters were, they assumed they were troll leaves. I think that's rather nice. Well, we've seen that already. So I mentioned Komori and some of the stones there. These, some of them are pretty indistinct. That one is quite clear. The body probably is, uh, but not many of them could write in those days anyway. That's 1822. And another one, 1828. All pre-clearance. These people, if they hadn't died, they would have ended up in Canada. That's some of the others as well, but in a writing discernible. Most of them didn't. And then suddenly a great storm arose at the like, This is a, a lightning storm in August 1977. Um, I photographed from Castle looking towards Mali. And you can see the big thick one on the left hit Mali that night and used all the lights. And I mentioned the rum clearance in 1826 and 1828 of 400-odd people all left. The boat there is the Captain Scott that was attached to the Lachiro Outdoor Center for a time. It was sold to the Arabs after that. And in fact, we went out to see around the Captain Scott the next morning. And that night before had been a rather misty, wet night. And the shear waters were attracted into the lights and collapsed onto the deck and vomited all over the deck. The boys had to scrub them the next day. There is a tradition, I don't know where it arose, um, that one last gesture of defiance before they departed, the islanders rolled an enormous uh, stone in place in their memory. I find that a bit unlikely. We always assumed it was a glacial erratic. Well, there's one of the school's every day in society put it a glacial erotic. <laughs> and off they went to Canada. I've since met one or two in Cape Breton with Father Bernie, um, who came, or ancestors came from Rome. And there's a witness to say that the people were carried off in one mass forever from the sea girds spot where they'd been born and bred. And the wild outcries of the men and the heartbreaking wails of the women and their children filled all the air between mountainous shores of the bay. And it was often said that they went voluntarily. I don't believe it. That was a shepherd who was brought in. They brought in 8,000 sheep instead of 420 people and ruined, they overgrazed the island and they very quickly, I think you said. So there are a few interesting quotes to end up with. At least 400 people when used this is to go account, found it necessary to leave. Um, we're all united in this general emigration to acquire the habits to which they had formerly been an entire stranger. Hugh Miller noticed that the island 18 years before had been, he was there in 1845, had been divested of its inhabitants, amounting at the time to rather more than 400 souls to make way for sheep, one sheep farmer and 8,000 sheep. So the ruins were left behind. Shepherds might have modified one or two of the shearings while they were up there looking after all these sheep. And Edward Waugh, who was a poet from Lancashire, 
who was there in 1822, 1882, said there's nothing left to mark the presence of its old population save the foundations of their dwellings. Their lives and their legends have no other memorials but the nettles growing in these places. And it was Edwin Waugh who actually um, interviewed uh, Kenneth McLean, who was the last one surviving by that time, who was an original ruler. And he gave the, fortunately, the Ordnance Survey a lot of the place names. That's a uh, print by Edward Dagel in 1817. That's actually the northeast end of egg with rum behind. That's what it looks like. And they brought in 120 people from Brackadale and Sky, probably another clearance to tend the sheep because they've forgotten that they need shepherds for 8,000 sheep. And this I caught it, it was photographed about 1920. It said at Kinloch, um, where the ruin, the only place where the ruins of the village is difficult now to discern. Uh, I'm not entirely convinced that you are, but never mind. Yeah, this is where they brought them in and they built, the sky folk built houses there because they could see um, Brackadale from there. This is also, it's called Port Nakarene, which is the port of the fish trap. And there are several places they could get fish at low tide in these traps. That's Ian to that photo of it looking down. And you can tell from Edwin Moore's description who lived in each of these houses. He walked along the length of it and described the families. So Hugh Miller, always solitary, did not seem as though the deep population of Rum had tended much to anyone's advantage. A single sheep farmer had been unfortunate in his speculations and has left the island. And these are shepherds that lingered on. I think the sheep were by that time reduced to about 5,000. Uh, this is interesting because right at the bottom you can see he spells Rum with an H in it, which is wrong. Um, but then he couldn't spell sacred properly and one or two other things. So this is his wife that died, and the shepherd directed that. And an interesting one is the Matheson slab, and that was the shepherd at Kilbori in 1873, who lost five of his children to diphtheria within five days, two or three days. And they were all the older ones. And there's a baby added to the bottom that died a couple of years before. And the, the wife was always to be seen at the graveyard in Komori. So they eventually emigrated to New Zealand, uh, worked in sheep farms. Um, the two eldest surviving sons uh, went exploring in the winter and they discovered and named Lake Matheson in the Southern Alps of New Zealand. A little memory of Rum, really. It's got a Maori name, of course. That's what Murdo and Christina Matheson, they came from um, Apple Crops originally. And rather nicely said, while I was there, a woman from New Zealand who was related to the great granddaughter of the son of this, this couple. Uh, came to Rome. I showed her around and we corresponded for a long time. She sent me a history of their family, which her father had put together. And uh, on the left there is Lutheran of Buckland, with ex-wife. Uh, I knew David Lewis father, a friend of Rome, Rome um, at that time. So, and then Hugh Miller, again, prophetic. A strange cycle, uninhabited, originally saved by wild animals, came up in early age to all effect, 
The island lost all its inhabitants in a world map of speculation, and now yet another change was on the eve of ensuing, and the island was returned to its original state as a home of wild animals. In other words, Lord Salisbury shooting state. That's the um, rum boat, split boat, as was then looking back towards the hills of Neudert and Slate Point of the Sky. One of my favorite views, photos, because um, that's Glasgow Hill from Rum, looking at Canna, which is my favorite island, looking at South Uist beyond with Rona. Sorry, Canna is my second favorite island. Rona, North Rona is my favorite island, and I called it my dog after that. <laughs> so it's got all my favorite islands in it. That's Rum from Los Stuart. In South Uist, that's uh, rum from the Lapoise of the Tell. That's rum from the Lapoise of Ferry, with Canna on the left. And that's it. Mm -hmm.